Um, Ngaba has been suspended by the provincial executive. You cannot go um, uh, on publicly and malign leaders of any organization. Um, you know, that will be investigated by any organization. No, nobody, there are internal processes to deal with that. If you really believe that you are being treated unfairly, we, the DA has the internal processes that are robust enough and in, independent and objective enough to be able to investigate that and deal with that. But you cannot go publicly and malign an organization. And I find this personally really, really sad, you know. We've built the DA over the number of years. Naba is not the only leader in the DA. We are all leaders. If I decide to go tomorrow and I'll say the DA is this racist organization and the DA is this Zionist organization, whatever mm. attack that I want. So was it not racist and Zionist while I was there for 15 years? We, at what point? Maybe it, it was, but you wanted to change things from the inside. Well, then I must be really blind. Yeah. Yusuf, thank you for sitting down with us. Um, I was just saying just before we started that the first time I saw you, was it 20, 2012? That was, what, 12, what, 11 years 11 ago? 11 years back, yeah. When you were the SRC president at Nelson Mandela University. I just want us to start maybe um, there and let's maybe start with your experience in SRC politics. I know that previously you were an ANC member and your whole family is an ANC member. We've spoken so much about that. But um, uh, what, what made you... Um, maybe let's start with that sort of what made you, what conscientized you about politics such that you felt you needed to join uh, and become part of the SRC and start up DAS or, you know, if you could just give us a bit of... Yeah, I think let's start with my upbringing. Yeah. Because I grew up uh, in an ANC household. Uh, a lot of uh, extended family were all involved with the ANC, mm. especially on my mother's side. So my mother's uncles um, and others were deeply involved uh, with the ANC. Some mm -hmm. of them were in exile with Thabo Mbeki. Many of them were public representatives for the ANC, mm. either as uh, deputy ministers, uh, becoming really? ambassadors, etc. So um, let me not mention their names, but, uh, but you grow up in those kind of circles. Uh. And uh, you start to understand politics from from the way that the ANC does politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's who you are. That's how, how, you, how you grow up. That's the kind of conversations that you are exposed to. And I think growing up into my teen years, I realized very quickly that the ANC that our uncles and parents and yeah. grandparents uh, supported is not the same ANC. Mm -hmm. The conversations are different. It's no longer about how do we develop our communities and how do we create a better life for our people. Mm -hmm. But the conversations become about how do people position themselves in order to access the state mm. and how people are being dealt with uh, in, uh, in a positioning and jockeying uh, for influence and, uh, and, and for positions. Mm. And I realized that I don't want to be part of those conversations. Yeah. So I never intended uh, being politically involved or having a career in politics. But when I was a student, I realized very, very quickly that the political options that were available to students were failing them. Mm. And at the time, it was only Sasko and uh, Azasko, which yeah. was uh, the I Azapo. Uh, yeah. I mean, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. But uh, Azasko was really quite uh, um, prevalent, mm. I, I would say, in some of the residences at the time. I think Zanadu mm. had a big uh, Azasko presence at that time. And uh, there was no other alternatives uh, for students. And in fact, when, when I first got there, um, w there was an election where they what had changed... Was that? So I registered 2009. Okay. Um, I matriculated 2008. But there was an election. I can't remember exactly which year, but there was an election where they had changed the entire electoral system. So it was no longer proportional representative. It mm. was first past the post. And SASCO basically took everything. What does that, what does that mean? So it means instead of uh, parties that contest getting uh, seats in uh, proportion to the mm. amount of votes, so let's say you get 40% of votes, yeah. you get 40% of seats. Yeah. It was first past the post. So every single uh, seat had to be contested. Oh, I see. So it depends how many the president, presidential candidates get, whoever gets the most votes um, oh, gets okay. elected. So one party basically is like winner takes all. Mm. Okay. And there was a year where Sasko basically had all the seats mm. um, on the SRC. And uh, I think it was probably the most corrupt year. <laughs> because, I mean, as yeah. they say, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there was a year where the SRC president 
um, I'm not going to mention his name, right? But yeah. the SRC president, I mean, I know, know him quite well. Um, hired a car on student money, crashed the car while he was drunk. What There's, is he doing now? The SRC um, no, I'm, it's, it's <laughs> gonna, <laughs> no, I try not to. I mean, I'm not going to attack people's characters, yeah. right? But I just want to paint the picture yeah, yeah, yeah. of what we found. You know, it's student money was being used for personal yeah. uh, funds. People were referred to as breadwinners on, yeah. the, on the SRC rather than students benefiting. And at that point, you know, I had started to, to get to know more about the DA. Mm. And it was new for me. You know, there was about two years where I couldn't attend any family functions because um, what the hell are you doing with the DA, yeah. uh, quite frankly. And we started to get the DA Students Organization built and recognized around 2009, 2010. Mm. In fact, we were only recognized about two to three weeks before the 2010 SRC elections, mm. and we won... 40% of the PR votes in that election. And uh, I then served on the SRC in 2011 and then was elected president um, in that election for 2012. That's amazing, yeah. man. I remember those years quite well because I remember seeing uh, Helen Ziller and you walking in on camp. I think it was around 2012. I'm not sure what was happening at the South Campus Auditorium, but it was yeah. packed. It was packed, yeah. It I think was that packed. was in the 2011 election going for, for, for the Is 2012 it? term of office, yeah. So, um, so how, how did your family take that? You know, what what made? I'm sure now they don't mind. I'm sure they see those that were in the ANC. Are they still in the ANC now? No, or? I think I mean in most of our families, people have changed. Eh? People it? have have started to become hurtful with with what's happened in the ANC. A lot of people thought, well, the ANC can renew itself and uh, become an organization that's rooted in communities as perhaps it was once mm. uh, in the past. It's just not the same way. Mm. ANC is taken over by thugs. If whoever's, whoever got the biggest metaphorical gun is going to rule the roost. It's no longer an intellectual organization. Mm. It's lost all of that. You just look at the branches. It's thugs that have taken over at a provincial level. Um, whoever can buy the most votes can win a Congress. Mm. And in that kind of environment, if you've got something to offer, you're not going to, you're not going to survive unless you're going to play the same kind of politics. And mm. you'll see a lot of your historical families in the ANC have sort of been sidelined or are no longer involved. Your well-known families. Families like? I mean, you can go into any community, mm. right? I'll start with the Muslim community as an example. The, the Muslim community had a very big uh, influence yeah. in, in uh, politics in exile, um, uh, the liberation struggle. They're no longer uh, prominent within ANC structures mm. at all. Go and look at, look at the national executive of the ANC that was elected at the last uh, conference. Um, you, th th those communities have are just not represented um, mm. at all. So many of our families that have, have a long history in the ANC have looked for alternatives because they felt this is not the same ANC that mm. we were building and a part of uh, in the past. Mm. They, you'll always get those uh, individuals that have remained loyal, but by and large, you know, all yeah. of my family have now, a lot of my family have now become DA voters. Yeah. I, I want us to, uh, in fact, I think the reason this conversation for me is very important is because I think you are the best person to educate myself and many other people on DA politics and what the DA stands for and why there are so many different opinions and views on the DA, uh, you know, and um, for instance, you know, on things like redress and land and all of those things. I mean, people have spoken about that multiple times on many platforms, but I think to just break, I think I, what I want this conversation to do is to break that down even further so that the ordinary person watching this can walk away with a clear understanding of what exactly the Democratic Alliance stands for, including myself. But... I want to start with the, the structures. I mean, it's something I don't understand. I think you were just explaining that yeah. to me before we started. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people understand the, the ANC because it's been around for so long and it's, you know, it's, it's gotten so much of airtime. So we know what the, the SG does and all of those things, just yeah. structurally how it's configured. It, you know, it, it, um, it's, it's, it's more understandable to a lot of people. But there are some people like myself, who don't understand the structure of the DA, you know, um, the federal leader, and you've got, I don't understand All any, of the jargon. I yeah. don't understand any of those things. Okay. So how do you explain that to an ordinary person who's sitting in Kwaza Kele, who just wants to get an understanding of structurally, how is this organization? Let me tell you this, it looks, the one thing I can give you is 
the DA is run like a well-oiled machine. That's, sure. you know, that's something I always say to people that, man, this organization, I mean, we walked in here, we saw the building, you know, it's, it's run like a the well. The lights are working, the, the walls are painted. You know, it's run like a yeah. well-oiled machine. So s structurally, how, how is this? So it's really quite simple. Configured. I mean, we are an organization that are rooted in communities. So therefore, our structures are made out of branches. Every single ward uh, can have a branch if they are able to exceed a certain amount of members. So if you have more than 25 members that you sign up in your ward, you can then launch a branch. What makes the DA very different from other political parties, and I think you've pointed it out, is the way that we are run. We are run as, as a well-oiled machine. But, it, but the, the other thing that separates us is that we have good systems and checks and balances that ensure that our, our structures cannot be manipulated, that political leaders cannot just uh, make decisions that can override the entire organization. We've seen it in these other political parties where if the leader decides something, their word is gospel, that's what needs to take place. But mm. that is not something that is healthy for a democratic organization uh, like the Democratic Alliance or like political parties should be. Mm. So we have our branches, and uh, our branches are then grouped into constituencies. Mm. And in the Eastern Cape, we've got 19 constituencies across the province. So, for example, my constituency is the P Northern Areas constituency. It's all of the wards, all the way from... Who decides... Whether that's your the, provin the provincial executive okay. demarcates the constituencies, and they can only do it once. So after every national and provincial election, so we're going to have it next year as well, the provincial executive will then decide, we are going to split up the, sp the province into these okay. particular constituencies so that our MPs and MPLs can serve residents mm. directly. I mean, that's the ideal. You go to other countries where... MPs and MPLs, members of parliament are elected directly. Mm. Take congressmen in the, in, in, in the United States as an example. Residents know who their congressman is. Yeah. They can email their congressman, they can call the congressman's office, they can make sure that their issues are being dealt with. Mm. So we want to be responsive uh, to our voters. We then appoint members of parliament or members of a provincial legislature to a constituency. Okay. Those constituencies are made up of a number of wards or a number of municipalities that are also made up of a number of wards. Mm. And that is where you have your political structures. You would have your branch. Your branches would all be allocated uh, um, delegates in okay. accordance to the, to the votes that they uh, bring into the party. They elect a constituency structure, a constituency chairperson, a constituency executive, okay. and they run the DA, uh, you see, for all intents and purposes, okay. in that constituency. Okay. But when I say what makes us differently is different from other parties is our systems is that our systems have checks and balances to ensure that there's fairness in the organization. Mm. Other organizations, what I've experienced, there's no fairness. They take one person from this place, they go and make them a councillor in another municipality, mm. for example. Um, political leaders and structures at, at a higher level can just decide who goes to parliament, who goes on lists uh, to Doesn't council. the DA operate like that? Not at all. Who decides? We have, uh, we have checks and balances that are built in to ensure that our, our processes cannot be manipulated. Mm. I'll give you an example. We are going to be electing members of parliament uh, and uh, members of provincial legislature in the next election. Mm. So what we have at the moment is anybody can make themselves available to be an MP or an MPL. Mm. There is then... Anyone a outside of the party or just anyone... In well, this, you have to meet certain screening criteria. Okay. okay? So obviously, you, you need to be a, re a registered voter in the province or you mm. need to be able to change your registration to the province because you can't represent people unless, mm. unless you are able to do so. And there's certain criteria that you are able to meet so that it qualifies you to stand mm. uh, as a candidate. But those individuals will then have to subject themselves to an electoral college. The Electoral okay. College is made up of elected representatives from each constituency across the province. So that they, those constituencies, which is our structures, because they are elected by the structures, mm. will then whittle the list down into a pool of candidates, which is quite small. It's double the seat target okay. that we expect to elect from the province. And then you would have, um, and, and they have to do their work impartially, mm. by the way. They will interview the candidates. They will then look at uh, how do they respond in the interview? What value can they add uh, to residents? Is there geographic spread across the province? We then have a selection panel 
um, that is uh, appointed by the provincial executive that then interviews um, all of the people that that come through the electoral college, okay. um, and then will stand and ranks, uh, you know, according to how people perform in the selection process. Mm. Difference is is that the provincial leader of the DA in the Eastern Cape can't just go and change the list. Okay. There's no deployment committee that sits around and decides, well, you know, we want to put this person high up, we want to put this person lower down, we don't like that person, let's, let's move them out of the way. The entire process is sort of firewalled from, uh, from, from politicians that might seek to manipulate uh, the process. You'll correct me yeah. here, but don't other parties also operate like that? I mean, when the EFF, when they have their, uh, you know, provincial elections, whatever it's called, um, they they have independent outside organizations that come in and run all of that. So the process should, in that case, be. Um, have Have you seen the 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 throughput rate of ANC mem I mean EFF members of parliament? I haven't. You there today? You'll be fired tomorrow. You say something that Julius doesn't like. You you're gone, bro. Like you're fired. I, they'll they'll rather you take them to court th than anything else. There's no there's no fair s structure or process that ensures that, that everybody is treated in terms of the rule of law, if, if you get mm. my point. Every single person in the DA, I mean, you can't, let's say John Stiernesen is the federal leader. You mm. can't just decide to wake up tomorrow and fire someone because he doesn't like what they've said or he doesn't like them. Um, Action SA recently mm. in Chwane, they were just firing people like it was going out of business. The Patriotic Alliance. If Gaten decides, I'm sure they followed no, their processes. No, they, and they just they they call a person in. They said, "Well, we've had a disciplinary, and then you fired, right?" The PA recently they've just appointed their, after the last elections, they took people from different municipalities and made them MMCs and councillors in other municipalities. No one asked the structures. There's no there's no process that you go through. The the the, the province isn't consulted. There are politicians that just make decisions. But this is your, yeah. it's almost like this is an outsider's perspective. You and I are not inside there. Yeah. We don't know what happens. So, so I'm, I'm just t telling you my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What makes me at home in the DA is that there's fairness. Okay. There's, there's objective processes mm. and systems where I know that there's absolute fairness. Yeah. I'll give you another example of this. Let's say the selection panel is interviewing you to be mm. a candidate for the DA. That entire interview process is recorded. Mm. There's an appeals panel that if you feel that you've been treated with unfairly or on a factional basis, there's an, an independent appeals panel from outside of the province that's going to watch the interview, mm. look at the scores that have been given, and that will be able to tell whether or not somebody's yeah. gone in there with a predetermined objective. Mm. So over years and years and years, we've built up these objective processes to make sure that yeah. people are treated fairly within an organization. I mean, I've been in the party now for 15 years, mm. and I can tell you something. The, the, the progress that we've made over the, those 15 years to ensure that people feel as if there's fairness mm. that takes place has been invaluable to internal unity within the organization. Um, just break this down in, in a minute for me, if you can. Um, you know, Helen Zira is the federal leader. The chairperson the of chairperson. our federal council. Okay, yeah. what does that mean? You've got, okay. you've got John Hayes as the federal leader. federal leader. So what does... How does it work itself down to the branches, as you've explained? If you could just okay. explain that in a minute. So let me start from the bottom up, okay? You've got your branches. Uh -huh. Your branches make up a constituency. Your constituencies make up your a region or a province. In some okay. provinces, you have regions. In, in others, you don't. It depends on the size of the province and mm. how, how many constituencies are in that particular province, etc. Your provinces then, then make up your federal council and your federal executive. Okay. The federal council is your larger body. They are the uh, highest decision-making body outside of our congresses, and people are elected onto federal council. So, so that would be the equivalent of an NEC? That'll be equivalent of like a ge national general council, as an example. How does that differ from an NEC or a Senate in Action SA's case? Okay, I don't know how Action SA. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Run the, I mean, for me, it feels as if Herman decides everything, yeah. but that could be my, my, my yeah. outsider's view, right? But the federal executive is your national executive, like okay. the NEC, okay? okay? Your federal council is like your NGC, your National General Council okay. um, in the ANC. It's a much larger, more representative body, uh, your, your, your federal council. How does the, these two, just work with me here because I'm just yeah. trying to understand. So how, does, how, how, how do these two structures interact with each other? How do they differ? Okay, 
So your your federal council is your your highest making decision structure. Okay. So if there's anything policy wise that needs to be adopted between congresses, it must go to the federal, federal council. Uh, council. And Helen Zilla is the chair. Is the, the chairperson? Okay. She's elected by members of the federal council to All chair. Right. Uh, it's it's a very administratively I see. Uh, strong role. It's it's really in terms of adjudicating the processes, the okay. systems that I've, I've spoken yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. How do you ensure that it's fair? How do you ensure there's objectivity? We get a legal opinion on something yeah. to ensure that is this really the fairest way to do something that we don't allow interference mm. uh, to take place that could marginalize people mm -hmm. and their their fair participation in a process. Mm. So Helen's really really good at that. Mm. Actually, she she is somebody that when she was the federal leader from those days looked looked forward and said you know what, for us to really be become a party that is stable, mm. we need fair, objective processes and systems. Mm. And she's really been good in the last couple of years of in adjudicating those systems as the chairperson of federal council because she was one of the people that pioneered those systems. Mm. And now she's looked at how do we panel beat these systems to make sure that it's completely objective, it's completely fair, and that people feel as if I can participate like any other member. You don't mm. have somebody that's got a platinum membership in the DA and somebody yeah. that's got a gold or bronze membership, but we can all sort of compete on an equal footing. I see. But then you've got your, politi your political leaders. Mm. Okay, so John is the federal leader. You then got Dr. Ivan Mayer. He's the federal chairperson of the party. So they are elected by the entire Congress. Okay. Um, so that's not really an internal role. That's more of an external role uh, in the DA. And that's also the deputy chairs um, that were elected, like Soli Malazzi, mm. uh, as an example. Uh, J.P. Smith is another one of them that were uh, elected. Deputy chair of the? Anton Predial, of the DA. The DA. Yes, so there are three deputy chairs. Sali Malazzi, Why Anton three? Predial, because they are, they are delegated responsibilities mm. um, by the federal chairperson, that's Dr. Ivan Mayer. So, for example, one of them would be in charge of ensuring that we have in engagement with stakeholders mm. on behalf of the DA um, across the country. Others might have other responsibilities yeah. that they are then... Uh, delegated in terms of their political roles. But they have specific roles. Mm. Your, your leaders that are elected by your Congress have s specific roles. Your federal council that Helen chairs and that you've got deputy chairs that are elected of the federal council itself mm. have more internal roles, okay. internal system roles, campaign roles to ensure that the internal uh, organization is run mm. correctly. Mm. You've been part of the DA now for 15 years. I'm sure you have noted um, gaps and mistakes that the party might have made in the past, past 15 years. So when you reflect and look back at the past 15 years, um, after everything that has happened, I mean, no party is perfect. What are some of those gaps that you see? Uh, maybe let me ask it like this. Um, you know, in terms of public perception, a lot of people would say that DA is racist. I mean, I'm sure this is not the first time you're hearing this or the DAs for white people and all of those things. Um, looking back in the past 15 years, what progress have you guys made um, to sort of overcome so, some of those um, views that a lot of South Africans might have? Sure. So, I mean, let's start with my own journey, hey, uh, Lupumlo. I, when I joined the DA, um, I also, maybe let's say beforehand, believed some of the misconceptions about the DA. Mm. There were times I picked up the phone, I phoned Helen, I said, Helen, is this true? Mm. Um, and was, I was that when you were? When I was still a student. Student. I promise you, when I was still a student, there were times I picked up the phone, I phoned Helen, when she was still the federal leader. Mm. And I said, Helen, is this true? Because some of, some of these narratives are quite convincing, mm. you know? And for me, a person that was still new in the DA, I also had to satisfy myself that I'm part yeah. of a party that is progressive. Yeah. I'm part of a party that is going to progress the lives of South Africans because of the history that we have from apartheid. How do we ensure that we progress our communities to ensure that all of our communities have an equal opportunity and that we are based on the right values and principles uh, in the party? So mm -hmm. there were a lot of things that I needed to satisfy myself with. And it, it's been a learning experience for mm -hmm. me. And no party is perfect. But what I've learned in my time with the DA is that a lot of these uh, perceptions, or I would say misconceptions, mm -hmm. I was able to satisfy myself, really get into the truth of it. How do I verify this information? Because mm. in the time of social media and WhatsApps and WhatsApp groups, is that information spreads quite quickly. Yeah. And a lot of disinformation spreads really, really quickly. And nobody verifies that information. Mm. 
So people just pluck it in groups, you mm. know, like all the aunties, for example, yeah. <laughs> wake up in the morning, see something, they get really angry about it and yeah. they just pluck it. By the time the aunties are done with you, I promise you, there's yeah. no way to dial back and, yeah. and verify that information. So it's been a personal uh, uh, learning experience for me. How do I be comfortable in the DA that really this is not the party that I was told about. Mm. It's not this party that's for white people where there's racial supremacy, mm. where, you know, all of these kind of uh, accusations that were made against the DA, I had to really become comfortable at first. But what are some of the things that I think we've, we've had to learn from? The first thing is when we, when we selected candidates in the DA, mm. our checks and balances, I believe, sometime when I first joined the party, were not robust enough. Mm. There was a time in the DA, and I've been quite vocal about this, uh, internally, where there could have been manipulation mm. in the selection of candidates. So if a political leader had enough clout, mm. they could manipulate the processes to ensure that a certain uh, grouping within the party is benefited uh, as opposed to another grouping. Mm. Now that kills organizations. It's factionalism. If you want to kill an organization, mm. when you come out of a Congress, uh, allow the people who won in the Congress to purge the people that didn't win. And you, you, you'll surely kill that organization. Mm. And our, our systems were not taken into account to give enough checks and balances to prevent people from mm. being able to do that. I think we've, be, we've come a long way in that respect. Um, there's no political leader that can just decide on lists that can interfere with lists. There are so many checks and balances that have now been built in from when I first joined the DA that it's impossible for people that win in a conference to go and purge uh, their political opponents um, afterwards. And I think that's been really healthy for the DA. Um, it's ensured that people that have maybe disagreed with each other are able to mm. work together in, in the interest of communities. And as an example of that, there are people that that manage the campaigns of opposing, uh, opposing sides. And I can mm. give you some examples in our provincial Congress um, elections that are now working together in our provincial uh, legislature and in parliament um, side by side, they were selected high up on lists, irrespective of what their leadership preferences uh, were in that respect. So that's one thing that I think mm. we've learned. Another thing is that you don't import or, or parachute people into positions. Mm. It's never ended well. Take Herman Mashaba as an example. Herman Mashaba has never built anything in the DA before the DA made him a mayoral candidate in the city of Johannesburg. What gave Herman Mashaba credibility in the DA? I was a DA member before Herman Mashaba. You're a DA member. You can tell us because no, you I was elected no, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm making a point here. Yeah. It's not only Herman Mashaba, for example. Lindibe Mazibuko. Hmm. Lindibe Mazibuko never built her way up the structures of the DA. Okay? People, people were parachuted but isn't, in, isn't into positions. Let me give you another example. Let's take Musi Mamani as an hmm. example. Musi found Yusuf Kassim in the DA. Okay? Musi found a lot of people of color in the DA, and yet he became the poster child for people of color in the DA. And when he decides that he wants to get up and leave because he's been defeated politically internally, then we must all account for that. But okay? you guys elected him, Yusuf? No, he was elected, but I'm saying this was a mistake. Okay. These are the mistakes that we have to learn from. You don't just go and elect people, mm. okay, or appoint them. Into, into strategic positions and, and very influential positions unless they have earned their way through the structures of the party. So would you say Musi, um, Herman, Lindio Mazibuko, they all didn't earn their way up into the structures of the party or maybe they all didn't deserve to have those positions in the DA that they, they had? Or? I don't believe that they, that they came through the structures of the party in the manner that you need to come through in the structures of the party to be able to represent the party at that particular level. But and, I, and, and, mm. and, and, and l let me put it to you this way. Mm. Any organization starts with its branches. If you've never led a branch, but you want to lead the DA, where do you get the credibility to do that? If you've never, if you, if, so if you've ne not come through the ranks, how are you going to authentically lead an organization. Why have those interviews and all those checks and balances if if, if, if you're going to throw out all of my experience? If I've led mm. 
I've started, you know, a company. I've led a non-profit for 15 years. I'll give you an example. Right here in Woma location, there's a beautiful organization called Masifundi. I'm sure you've seen it. Led by a great guy who's, been built, who's built that from scratch from nothing for 15 years. So are you telling me that that guy, if he wants to make a contrib positive contribution to the DA, he must then spend another 15 years coming up the structures no, if he has the experience no, not at and all. the expertise? No, not at all. But if you want to represent people, you need to be able to earn the trust of the people that you want to represent. Being a public representative is not being an official. Mm. It's not a job. If you want to be an official, that's fine. Be an official, go and be a municipal manager or a director and go and serve people in that mm. way. But if you want to represent people as a public representative, mm -hmm. you need to earn the trust and the support of the people that you want to represent. You can't impose people to, to represent them. How do you expect a community, once they've had someone imposed on them, because we think that this person you know, should be representing those people, they ne they've never earned the trust of those people. Mm. How do you expect them to be... To, 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 how do you expect the people that's imposed to them to authentically represent those people in councils, yeah. in legislatures, in parliament? Because it's not, it's, it's not a job that you do. It's, you are representing people mm. in that respect. So I would expect people that want to represent other people to go to the ground and earn the respect mm. of the people that you want to represent. Because what I don't want to do is be in a, in a position where I say, Let's take Lupumlo, who's who spent 15 years building in, in, in the NGO sector. Mm. Let's make him a member of parliament. Then I need to impose him on a constituency and say to that constituency, this is your new le leader. This mm. is your new representative. And Lupumlo, he's never, he's, never, he's, never he's never served in any of the structures. Mm. He's never served in a branch. He's never served in a constituency. He's, he's never got experience of the people that he wants to lead. How do you expect him but to lead my point, people? My point there, Yusuf, is that Lupumlo has led... Um, a whole community of people has served these people for 15 years. And if Lupumlo were to be, quote unquote, parachuted to parliament, uh, and that were to be his constituency, he wouldn't be a foreign face in that community. So in that way, Lupumlo doesn't then have to start from the bottom in the DA and work. He said, he, these people already know him. The, he's, I've, he's been serving these people. So... I'm just trying to understand that point so, of so, just so, coming so, through because so, so, yeah, so, it yeah. sounds like, um, yeah. sorry to cut you, because it, yeah. sounds, it sounds a lot like ANC rhetoric. Like in the ANC, you, everyone, you know, I had a conversation about this with uh, um, Lincoln Mali. I'm not sure if you mm. know him, wrote a beautiful book, Blazing a Trail on Leadership. And I was asking him about making a difference. How, how and he was, his point to me was, he can't make a difference because, because of this very sentiment and perspective that you must work your way up. He doesn't have that time. He's got the experience. He's an experienced executive, traveled the world, has served so many people. So he was saying to me, how, do you, how, do you, how does he then subject himself to that process of waiting another 15 years when he knows he's got the expertise to make a difference now at provincial level? I'm just trying yeah, to... But I think you're confusing things here, Luke. Uh -huh. If you've got the expertise to make a difference yeah. in a municipality, in a province, in a provincial department, by all means, go and make a difference. Mm. Okay, We believe as the DA that our administrations must not be politicized. Okay. We don't believe in cater deployment. We don't believe that you must be a DA member in order to go and serve an administration and go and turn that administration around. That's okay. what's killed our municipalities and our governments mm. is when you have cater deployment of caters that have absolutely no expertise, but because of who they are connected to, they then land themselves into positions where they are not able to serve mm. communities. So go, by all means, go and make a contribution. But if you want to represent people, you want to lead people, you have to earn the trust of the people that you want to represent and lead. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend 15 years in a DA structure. Mm. To, I mean, there are people that have become members of parliament in the DA at a very young age. I'm one of them, yeah. by the way. In the DA, we believe if you are good enough, you are old enough. Yeah, I've yeah. seen Bex and uh, you, you've got Shomela so many, so many across the country yeah. Yeah, that are adding so much value. They don't have to wait to be in a queue like in the ANC, mm. and you'll be sixty or seventy years yeah. old before you go and represent people in Parliament. Not a chance. So it's not about how old you are, but let's take Bex as an example. Bex has earned his keep in the DA. Bex wasn't parachuted into leadership. Bex has been in a branch. Bex has shown that he can win elections, strategic elections as a campaign manager. He has shown that he can represent 
uh, people. He's proven himself internally in the organization. And when Bex leads a constituency like Alfred Inzo constituency, where he's the constituency leader, mm. he's, he's, he's really been a trailblazer in that constituency because he can lead with authenticity. Mm. Nobody's taken Bex from somewhere and gone and imposed himself on the councillors of the, Al the Alfred Inzo constituency and said, here's, here's Bex, he's going to be your new leader. Mm. <laughs> Do you get my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't expect political leaders to be imposed on constituencies and, and expect them, they've never led in any of the structures of the organization to be able to make a success of it. Mm. And this, is, this has something to do with leadership as a whole. You know, a lot of people uh, sort of, when Musi resigned, so well, you know, that's the end for black people in the DA because the, black, the first black leader that the DA has had has left the party. And I thought to myself, I mean, I've, I've, I've always had a very good relationship with Musi, um, and we've always maintained a very good relationship, but I thought to myself, how is it that Musi then becomes the poster child of, for people of color mm. in the DA? Musi found us in the DA. Mm. Um, I remember meeting with Musi in Gauteng. I'd already been in the DA for six years. This, he was still new in the DA mm. um, at the time. Yes, Musi had a lot to offer the DA, but what are the, what are the lessons that we have to learn here? where people get into leadership positions, you are o there's always going to be political battles mm. in leadership positions. I I've got my own political battles, and he had his own political battles, okay? But when you lose a political battle internally, now it's all about the race that you represent. Does that mean that colored South Africans, black South Africans, cannot lose internal political battles? Because if they do lose those internal political battles, it's an entire race mm. that has no place in the DA. Surely it can't be the case. And that is why I believe very, very strongly that you cannot parachute people into positions. People have to earn. You must have an internal constituency so that you have authentic support within the organization so that if you lose a political battle, so be it. Okay? But it cannot be the case, Lupumlo, that Yusuf Kassim wants to be in the provincial leadership of the DA or in the federal leadership of the DA and he hasn't worked his way through the structures and he's expected to now make decisions on behalf of people that serve at a ward level, at a VD level, at a constituency level, and, and he's not able to do so because he hasn't really, really come through uh, those structures. And I think for a time, the DA, as the DA diversified, because the DA is, is, is a very different party today than what it was when I joined the DA or mm. before that. The DA is a very diverse organization. At our federal Congress, you, you can see the delegates that come from structures across the country. It is, it is so amazing to experience. People from all communities, rural, urban, black, white, colored, Indian, every single community is, is represented. But I think as we diversified as a DA, there were, there were individuals that were sort of elected into positions, having, I don't believe, come through the ranks sufficiently enough to mm. be able to manage those positions. And you're not doing those people a service, by the way, because if you're not ready for a challenge, you're not going to be able to, to, to be successful in that respect. We should have rather given it time as the party diversifies, mm. let people rise. Soli Malazzi has ri risen through the ranks. Soli Malazzi has not been, sorry, has not been imposed mm. um, or promoted in the party. He was elected by a Congress of, of DA people. But Soli has served at every single level that, if, that you can think of. And I mean, that's a really good example that one could use of, of people of all backgrounds that are coming through the ranks. And if we say we want the best people for the job, then it must, that, then it must be the case internally as well. If we had more time, I was going to ask about who, who is actually imposing all of these people. Um, I mean, who imposed um, the Action SA leader, Herman Mashaba, and who imposed mm. all of these. But I don't think we have... I, I, I can give it to you in, in a second so mm. you can understand it. The party has selection processes. And we've selected people who we believe are fit for purpose. And when we select people, we, we, let's say we have a mayoral selection panel. So Herman Mashaba comes through a mayoral selection panel for the DA. And then we say Herman Mashaba is going to be our mayoral candidate. What, sh what we should do as a party at that point is review and say, has this person... I mean, do they have the political credibility to go and lead a DA caucus in the city of Johannesburg, for example? Or should we say, if you want to be a mayor for the DA, if you want to be a premier, if you want to be whatever, you should still, you, sh you should first build some leadership credibility internally within the DA mm. before we expect you to go and lead people. Because that is a form of imposition. It's not 
some leader somewhere that's imposing. Mm. But it's people that come through a selection process. And then at that point, they are then expected to go and lead a caucus uh, of the DA. My, my, my biggest, and you asked what, le what lessons are we learning? I mean, the DA really, at this point in time, I think we've stabilized quite well. I was really just reflecting on the lessons, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. of certain outcomes that I think have come back to hurt the DA because people mm. have an impression of the DA that's not accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm looking at a picture of Ngaba and I can't help myself ask, because we're speaking about, uh, I mean, we're speaking about so many people that have left the DA. And again, I'm well aware that, I mean, you guys get these questions all the time. But I, I mean, I saw this post um, uh, when three or four days ago that he was saying Helen Zilla is racist and all of that. Uh, what's your view on what's happening with Ngaba? I mean, I've seen you guys work very, very well together. I mean, someone would assume that Ngaba was a legit, proper DA leader, made a contribution. Um, you know, I don't know what the stats are in terms of how many people joined the DA because of him in various constituencies, but what do you make of him saying Helen Zilla is racist at the backdrop of so many other people that have left and that have perhaps shared similar intimates about maybe Helen Zilla, you know, I think of uh, Herman Mashaba that said so much about Helen Zilla. So you know what's really ironic about this, Lupumo? I mean, let's take Herman Mashaba as yeah. an example. A couple of months before Herman decided to do that, he was praising Helen. Mm. When did she become racist then? Do, do you get my point? Did she become racist now after that? Because he said it publicly. He tweeted about it, mm. actually. And he said about how amazing Helen is. and uh, It could have um, been that he had, he had that a revelation of a racism, maybe in a particular instant. Something happened. Then the I light mean, bulb went pe people on. Don't just be, people don't just become racist. You're either racist or you're not. I mean, I've worked with South Africans. I've worked mm. with people that are genuinely racist, right? person is either racist or they're not racist. Mm. A person can't just become, if you disagree with someone, let's say I disagree with you tomorrow, or if uh, you know I feel like I'm going in a different direction, a person just can't just become racist overnight. Nava is a person that has always praised Helen, by the way, publicly and privately, mm. and uh, for how progressive she is as an individual. Now, I don't know these allegations that he has made about an investigation that he says is being done. We don't believe it to be, you know, we haven't seen any evidence in this respect because it was alleged that she was in PE mm. or, you know, that couple of days before that post. And she was never uh, in town. She's never, she wasn't in town. During the, so I don't know what information was given by people that he says, you know, have given this. We, we, we dismiss the credibility of that information, um, of what has been said. It's really unfortunate that he may, might have believed what has been said to him, but we've gone to verify. Is it true? You start there, right? Yeah. Why is Helen in town that, he, that alleged to go investigate him on his, on, on, on his relationship with Anele Kaba, whatever it is, okay? She was not in town. So whoever's given information, obviously they've got their facts wrong. So we don't know um, what is the, the truth of the allegations, and uh, we've tried to verify. There's no evidence that's been given to us that has been able to confirm um, the, the truth of those allegations. Mm. But what I can say is that this matter is under investigation. The provincial executive has uh, reflected on it. Um, Ngaba has been suspended by the provincial executive. You cannot go um, uh, on publicly and malign leaders of any organization. Um, you know, that will be investigated by any organization. Mm. No, nobody, there are internal processes to deal with that. If you really believe that you are being treated unfairly we, the DA has the internal processes that are robust enough and in, independent and objective enough to be able to investigate that and deal with that. But you cannot go publicly and malign an organization. And I find this personally really, really sad. You know, We've built the DA over a number of years. Naba is not the only leader in the DA. We are all leaders. If I decide to go tomorrow and I'll say the DA is this racist organization and the DA is this Zionist organization, whatever mm. attack that I want... So was it not racist and Zionist while I was there for 15 years? We, at what point? Maybe it, it was, but you wanted to change things from the inside. Well, then I must be really blind. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I must have been really blind. I mean, Naba's been the leader of the DA in the Eastern Cape. 
He's the, he was the leader, leader of the official opposition. He served in parliament. He served in the provincial legislature. He's been a mayor for the DA. Um, I mean, if an organization is racist, what are you going to change from the inside? I promise you, if the DA is racist, I leave tomorrow. I'm gone. There's no, the, you can't change a racist organization. You, you can't change an organization that discriminates on any basis, whether it's on religion, whether it's on color. Mm. Any organization like that has no place in South Africa, no, in mm. any country. Uh, whatsoever. So when did the organization become racist? When did this individual that you are now accusing uh, become racist? I really find it, I find it in poor taste. I promise you tomorrow I might disagree, I might lose political yeah. battles, okay? And you must clip this up and remind me of it. <laughs> promise you. <laughs> but I might lose a political battle. It's not unheard yeah. of. We all lose internal political battles or we disagree with, with something. Did, did Nava lose a uh, political battle? No, I'm saying he might have a disagreement with Helen yeah. and he might believe, I don't know, uh, wh what it is, but I'm only consuming from what he said, yeah, yeah. okay? But we might have a disagreement. Let's say I have a disagreement with, with the leadership of the DA. I mean, I can't decide to then start accusing people uh, of, of racism. Uh, let me say, say a final thing, uh, you know, because that, that accusation is quite damaging in the South African context. But let me just play devil's advocate for a, mo for a moment. Let's say the allegations are true. Mm. Let's say the allegations are true, which, as I said, there's no evidence to this effect. But let's say the allegations are true that Nava believes that Helen is investigating him. Okay? How does that make a racist? If, if, they, if somebody have made an allegation of any person in the DA and people investigate that allegation, how does that make a person racist? Do you get my point? Yeah, but I'm because sure that's, the, the I'm, DA, sure, I'm sure he's, he's not saying that because of the allegations. I mean, that's why I, you, that's I, what I, I want to speak to him and find out. But I'm sure he's not saying Helen is racist because, uh, you know, he, he, she's investigating him or anything like that. That would be absurd. I'm sure. No, but that's, got, what the, that's what the post said, right? The post said that it's he's hurt because he was told that Helen was in town to investigate him because of X, Y, and Z, right? We verified Helen wasn't in town. We haven't seen any evidence that mm. there's this investigation against him. As a provincial leadership, I would expect to be kept abreast yeah, of yeah, any yeah. Uh, investigation that's taken place in my province. And I promise you, um, we would have been aware of that if there was such an uh, investigation. So I don't know what was told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, okay? Mama is a friend of mine. And have I'm you guys spoken? No, we have. Um, on the same day, we, we, we had a conversation. Um, and I'm not going to divulge, mm. uh, you know, how that conversation went. But uh, Nava, Nava has always been a friend of mine in the organization. I'm not going to in any way attack him. Th he's entitled to his views. He's not entitled to attack the party publicly. But I'm playing devil's advocate here. If mm. a person is investigating you, how does that make them racist? Do you get my point? Yeah. For you to be a racist, you must believe in racial supremacy. Yeah. And you must treat people differently on the basis of race. And I haven't seen any evidence of people being treated in the DA. People of all races have been fired or investigated. But the media doesn't <laughs> focus on yeah. that. There was an MMC in Johannesburg, Sharon Peets, that was relieved of her duties because of uh, a report about how certain travel, et cetera, was being done in Johannesburg. I didn't see the media reporting and say the DA is purging white people, mm. uh, OK? because and investigating white people. No, we will treat people on the basis of the evidence. It's fairness. It's we will treat you on the merits of the facts, no matter you know what race you might belong to, what what religion you might belong to, what is your sexual orientation. People must be treated with treated with dignity and with fairness and, and, and as individuals. So this allegation of racism only comes, and I've seen it, when people are are, are, are wanting to move out and now they feel this is the best way to harm the DA's brand because the, D the DA is susceptible to attacks of, of, of being labeled as racist. But why was the DA not racist for all the years that you were part of the organization and all of a sudden you now want to call the DA racist? Herman Mashaba, go and check his tweets, was praising Helen Ziller th two or three months before he decided that he's going to walk. Mm. And now um, the easy thing for him to say is that Helen Ziller is a racist. I mean, really, there is no integrity in that kind of a statement to start uh, doling out those Let's look uh, at some of your policies. I'm conscious of time. Let's look at yeah. some of your policies, man. And I really, I'm asking because I I really, I'm trying to get a better, deeper, um, clearer understanding of where the DA stands 
and what informs some of the policy stances of the Democratic Alliance. Let's look at something like, you know, land. So in terms of land, what's the stance of the DA in one minute or less? Okay, so I mean, the first thing is that what makes us different from the ANC and the EFF is that we believe in individuals having the right to own land. Mm. The EFF, for example, believes that land must be vested in a state. We're mm -hmm. completely against that. You just have to look at the, the, the poor farmers in Guachu who have become uh, tenants of the state and cannot benefit from the land that they are supposed to have ownership uh, to. It reduces people essentially to a feudal system where you become tenants uh, to the state and the state can then decide to do what they will uh, in that respect. The ANC, unfortunately, has failed in terms of land reform. The DA believes that we must have meaningful uh, land reform. And you'll find that the land reform programs that, uh, that have been the most successful were successful in the Western Cape. And the reason for that is because whilst land reform is a national competency, agriculture is a provincial competency. So where land reform programs had to be supported by provincial departments of agriculture, they were successful uh, in, in, in a province like the Western Cape because the DA believes in meaningful uh, land reform where beneficia beneficiaries that that come through the land reform process are able to be supported to make a success of ownership of their land. So there must be meaningful uh, land reform in South Africa. However, and if you look at Khalima Motlante's high-level report into uh, land reform that came out, I think it was before the 2019 elections, he found, former President Motlante, in his report, that the obstacles to successful land reform in South Africa was not uh, the ability to expropriate without compensation. Actually, the obstacles were the way that the land reform process was being run, the corruption in the process, the money mm -hmm. that was being budgeted uh, in that respect. The ANC, unfortunately, having failed our people for a number of years in order to, to, to have any meaningful transformation, whether it's in uh, uh, economic empowerment of uh, employment, or whether it is in land ownership and land, uh, 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 in terms of land beneficiaries, must always find a scapegoat mm -hmm. uh, in the system. And this is just another rabbit hole that we've been led out, led down into to try and find a scapegoat uh, in the system. We don't believe that making land rights insecure in South Africa is going to benefit uh, South so, Africans. So, yeah. uh, it, you know, in, in about 40 seconds or less, so I still don't quite understand what meaningful land reform is. I agree with you when you say, you know, the ANC has messed it up and there's so much of corruption in, in how they've executed all of this, but what does the DA mean when it, when it speaks about so meaningful so land, land reform? If you are a land reform beneficiary, okay, you are, th there, is, there, is a, there is a beneficiary process that land reform claimants go through. Mm. If you are a land reform, you are, if you are a beneficiary of the land claim process, you must be empowered to, number one, own the land okay. that is being allocated to you. So land security of tenure is really important in any economy. If we cannot have, for example, um, the, you know these windmills, these yeah, wind yeah, yeah. farms that you see. I visited a lot of the wind farms. The mm. biggest problem with investment of wind farms in the Eastern Cape has been completely left behind is because there isn't security of land mm. as it exists in a lot of the land in our province. So these, I mean, it takes about 20, 10 years or it's, a, it's quite a long process before you can get the process done. And you need to be able to forecast your 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 enterprise over a quite 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 a long runway. So mm. land tenure is really really important. A person to be able to own land as individuals and at every level, whether mm. it's your the, the, the land where your house has been allocated to you, such as RDP uh, beneficiaries. The DA always tries to ensure that those beneficiaries have access to title deeds. Whether it's to farming land or other land that you are that are, you are allocated, you must have land tenure. Secondly. You must be supported to be able to ensure that you can have a profitable enterprise of that land. Okay. So the departments of agriculture become really, really important. Unfortunately, like in the Eastern Cape, Department of Rural Development and uh, Dr. Da Agriculture mm. ha has not been successful in ensuring that land reform beneficiaries are able to, to have a successful enterprise uh, on their land. We've also tested other mechanisms in the Western Cape through employee share ownership schemes okay. to ensure that you can have a successful enterprise where employees can benefit um, as from dividends of, of the enterprise. So that's what we mean by meaningful uh, land reform. There's nothing progressive about a system that leaves people 
worse off than when they, mm. than, or, or not better off than where they start. So just because something might be a radical idea, if it does not provide a benefit to, to, to communities and to individuals, there's nothing progressive about this. This is what Julia says. Yeah. I'm sure you, you know this better than me. And, and this is, I, I was watching one of his interviews, and this is what he said to the journalist, that if, if, um, if you steal my car and I come and take it from you mm. and I give you a lift in the car, then that would be the right equation or the right way of handling this whole land question. And his point is that land has been stolen. Uh, and I mean, we all know the narrative that he says, you know, white people came, they stole land and it should be taken from them and given to the rightful owners of the land in inverted commas. So in so what do you make of that, of those statements that Julius Malim, See, bearing yeah. in mind that mm. in terms of land ownership in the country, a huge bulk of the land is owned by a minority of people. So what do you... So, I mean, a, a huge bulk of the land in any case are owned by smaller amounts of people. And I think that's in any country. When you have your big farming interval, let's look at agricultural land as an example. Most citizens of a country don't own. Um, they'll, you'll own the property where you stay mm. and you, you might invest in, for example, uh, a company that does agriculture and then you own shares in that company, and then you maybe indirect ownership in that uh, in that uh, uh, way. But I mean, large parts of the world, it's not it's not about subsistence farming. Mm. It's not small yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of like you know like land parcels, yeah. uh, etc. What Julius tries to do is simplify <laughs> something, a, issue. A, a very very complex issue, um, in order to sound populist on the matter. It, it doesn't it doesn't benefit the economy um, to say let's strip away all land. Uh, uh, ownership rights and let's uh, uh, let's say let's take all of the land and let's just divide it up uh, at the end of the day you would have huge capital flight out of any country yeah, yeah, that yeah. does that it happened to our neighbors it has happened um, in other it doesn't have to be only land it happened in uh, for example mining rights in Venezuela as an example mm. so if you if you feel that well you know the uh, uh, this uh, particular land was stolen I mean that land could have had its ownership transferred over uh, the last hundred years, the current people that might be owning that land might have bought the land and might have taken a bond from from a bank mm. in order to, and they have to pay a bond every month because they've purchased this land. Whoever it is, the land was originally allocated to must might have long sold it five or six or seven times mm. since then. And you say, well, let's strip out let's strip out all land ownership of land, and let's expropriate without any compensation for somebody that might have a bond hold over that land. You're going. That's the quickest way to kill the economy uh, in a country and ensure that there is no investment that takes place. There's no enterprise. In the Eastern Cape, we've got a lot of land. Mm. How much of that land is actually productive as compared to the Western mm. Cape? Fly into Mtata Airport and look at, at land that has not been developed at all and fly into uh, Cape Town Airport and look at the enterprises that take place. If if the utilization of land is bringing jobs, is bringing other industries, um, you know, downstream industries and and uh, uh, procurement links uh, in, in, into that com industry, it benefits communities. Mm. If the land is uh, is not bringing that uh, into our communities, there's nothing progressive for our people. Mm. And that's why we believe as the DA, it's important that there is a, a correction of the injustice. There must be. If you have been how through the land reform process, there is a land reform process. Mm. The land reform process has been bungled. Now the ANC bungles the process and now they want somebody to blame okay. uh, for their own failures. We are now close to 30 years after 94 and by now they haven't been able to main, mm. make meaningful progress on, on, on beneficiaries that are legitimate claimants that should be able to, to, to benefit from the land of South Africa. Whose fault is that? Mm. It's, not, it's not existing landowners. It's those that have been given the opportunity to go and redress the legacies of the past, yeah. and and now you say, well, let's let's go the Zimbabwe route because because we've we've been unable to run uh, a, a proper land reform process to benefit uh, people in South Africa. You cannot kill the economy because you failed to run uh, because you failed in land reform. The ANC yeah. has failed in land reform. I believe a DA government would be able to ensure that there is justice for people who had a land that was stripped from them. And uh, under both the colonial years and the and the apartheid years, they can ensure that they can not only have access to to land that that through the claims process, but they will also be empowered to make a success 
um, of any enterprise or be, be, be successful landowners to benefit their families and create gener generational wealth for their children. So yeah. in, in handling that situation, would, are you saying that a DA government would then, for instance, I'll give you my scenario. I'm originally from Middle Way, Cape in Mubay, a municipality. My grandmother, who's still alive, uh, used to stay in the town. Mm -hmm. uh, apartheid government came, moved her and the whole family, chucked her into the township, which is where she stays now. And they took that, they gave that land, piece of land, which is a nice piece of land to another family. Mm -hmm. And through the past 20, 30 years, we've tried many processes and we haven't gotten any assistance from the NC government. So in that, in that situation, what do you do as the DA government? Do you then say to that family, we're going to give you money for this land, so go and, or do you say like the, the EFF, uh, you know, so how, how, would, how do you handle that practically so, so in the, my situation? So, the, so I mean, let, let's look at it practically. There's a land reform process, okay? So your family would have been a, a claimant mm. in the land reform process. The running of the land reform process is key in this respect. I can compare it to the building of RDP houses. You know, there were years that we built 50, 100,000 houses. There were years we built 5, 10,000 houses. Mm. Some municipalities, you're building, building zero houses. So it doesn't matter where you are on the housing list. But if there's no houses being built, and the, the process, if, if the program has not been run properly, people are not going to benefit. Mm. So in terms of the, the land claim list or beneficiaries and land claimants, if you're running um, that program effectively, you will be able to ensure that beneficiaries get justice in the process. If you're not running it uh, um, effectively, you're going to wait for another mm. 30, 40, 50 years uh, before you can ever see any benefit from that claim. In fact, you might never see benefit from that claim. But if you decide that you're going to hand over your power to the state to own all land, how are you going to benefit from that mm. anyways? Because the EFF wants, to, wants the state to own all the land. And if you're saying, well... But I might be able to use that land for free. No, you might be able to, or you might not. It might be someone that's connected to the EFF, <laughs> like, like the Mugabe is owning seven farms, yeah. as an example. There's no guarantee that your family is going to yeah. benefit from that land. The only guarantee that I can tell you might happen is that people that are connected to the political elite, as has happened in every other example where this has taken place, will be the ones that might benefit. But they're not even going to benefit. It's not even like the community is going to benefit because... You have one person owning seven or eight farms. Mm. That person's not running the farms. They, you can find them in Kubana on a, on a Friday night or mm. a Saturday night. And, and uh, all the tractors are being uh, taken apart. All the equipment is being sold off to fund their lifestyle. Mm. There's no jobs for our people. There's nobody that's benefiting from the end of the day. You can take so many examples locally. Elexcor diamond mine. Mm. I mean, you have to be really bad to run a diamond mine mm. uh, into a ground because diamonds are really... Uh, um, uh, expensive and they're really lucrative uh, to be yeah. able to trade in. Okay, Alexco Diamond Mine was a well-run mine that was gener that was creating jobs, generating tax revenue for the state, and and benefiting other industries. You mm. know that supplied the mine that that uh, beneficiated what came out of the mine and so forth. When the government took over Alexco Diamond Mine, um, just to be able to keep the mine alive, the state had to bail out the mine just to keep the jobs going, mm. and and now it went into liquidation. Okay, mm. because they were not able to run a profit, profitable enterprise. There's no investment to, to dig shafts, to, to employ people, to, to, to get out the, the, the minerals. Every single time where we want government to run things, it's, it's, jobs are lost. Yeah. In fact, the state is, not, is just not, not, even, not even benefiting tax revenue. It's now having to use other tax revenue to try and keep the jobs going or, or bail out the enterprise. Last one on yeah. this question, because I really want to hear what you would do Yes, you've said implement the current land reform policy, but what would you do to that other family? And bring, bring this back to my uh, scenario here. So as the DA government, so what, what do you do? So I, I, I still want that piece of land because it belong, rightfully belongs to my grandmother. So DA government, what do you do in that instance? So, so, I mean, like I said, these are complex. You, you want to solve this problem? It's not going to be a simple way to solve it. These are complex uh, problems to solve mm -hmm. in South Africa, okay? What you, what you do need to have is a growing economy. Because if you have a growing economy, you can budget sufficiently for the land process. The, the ANC is under budgeted. So that you can for, pay. So, no, so that you can ensure that you can compensate current that family. owners. Remember, that family might have bought that piece of land. That family is not necessarily the same family that was allocated a free pass. But piece what of if land. it is? No, I'm just saying, mm. over years, mm. you know, land has been 
uh, sold, bought and sold and developed over many, many years. So, I mean, we've had people that we've assisted directly as land in the land claims uh, process. Um, we're talking about over 100, what, 120, 130 years ago. That land would have been alienated, sold, bought, whatever, over years. So let's say your family has bought land somewhere, okay? And now the government says, well, this land is part of the land claims process. We're going to take it for nothing. What happens to the bond that you've got on that land? Mm. Are, are, are we saying that now the government next is going to bail that, out the, that would the be banks? That's stupid. That would yeah, be is the government going to bail out the banks <laughs> on all mm. the bonds? That mm. Do you get my point? You will yeah. kill, the entire economy will be gone, let alone... Uh, Zimbabwe, it would be worse because the capital flight out of South Africa and the amount of people that are that are having to be sustained by the current economy would be completely left uh, jobless and, and destitute. Mm. So you have to think of what is the best way to assist, fix the, the, the injustice, but at the same time, ensure that you don't tank your economy at the, uh, in that. The only way to do that is to budget sufficiently as a state. So that you can to, pay. So that you can compensate land over owners or compensate um, beneficiaries that maybe don't want the land. Maybe they want to have the value of the land to maybe buy a business or to or to buy another piece of land somewhere else where they can cultivate that land. My final question, and we don't have time to get into all of the other things. Um, you know, the the conference or where John Stanison was elected. Mm. I think you guys um, he came out and said EFF is enemy number one. And I'm still trying to grapple my hand around what that means or why a political party would say another political party that is not in government is an enemy. Um, I was just talking to someone this morning who's a business leader in the city, and we were talking about uh, working together towards working together and um, sort of taking on a more solution centered approach towards solving the problems that we have in our communities. So what do you make of that statement? How do you explain that to people when the DA takes that posture and says EFF is enemy number one? So, I mean, we've moved out of our just partisan DA politics um, from that conference. You'll hear John talking about the moonshot pact. Yes, 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 yes. There's going to be a moonshot convention, I believe, in August um, where... It's not, it's not about the DA or this party or that party. It's really about saving the country. I don't think uh, many of us have woken up to the fact that our country is so far down the line that it's mm. going to take such a massive effort to turn things around. We are now spending more on servicing government debt in the national budget than any other expenditure I item. So before we can even spend on education, health care, housing, the needs of our people, uh, you know, social grants, etc. We are now having to spend interest on the money that the government is borrowing in order to um, have your billions of rands in wasteful expenditure, irregular expenditure, fruitless uh, expenditure that has taken place now over so many years that it has now caught up with us to such an extent where it's either save the country or the country is gone. Mm. And in within that frame, it's not just about the DA. I mean, we are working with so many other parties that might want to take some DA voters, for example, but we have, let's put our differences aside and let's work together to save South Africa. But the reason why John might have said, and I can't remember that he said those exact words, mm. but John might have said EFF is enemy number one. It's because when you, when, you, when you hear the EFF and the policies that they want to implement, if South Africa is in ICU, um, it's akin to saying, Let's 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 break into ICU and burn it down and kill the and burn you know let's just burn everything down. Mm. The economy will be in ruins if we have to follow that kind of a policy outlook, as has been done in countries like Venezuela, in Zimbabwe, and other countries uh, w w that have followed the kind of ideas that they have advanced. And if you had to have a coalition government, which it's looking likely, I mean the ANC have been cracking as low as forty percent mm. in our in our polls, sometimes even lower. Yeah, to have a coalition, uh, look at scenarios after next year's election, and have the ANC in coalition with the EFF, that is the doomsday scenario that one has to try and anticipate and work against. Because if the EFF had to go into coalition with the ANC, they would be able to strong, heart, strong arm the ANC into adopting policies that will kill our economy and kill our country. It will be the end of South Africa. It will be the end of the South African economy as we know it. And we all have a responsibility to go out and save South Africa. So when we say 
say South Africa, we're really talking about ensuring that we can, uh, that, that we don't leave South Africa as this destitute wasteland mm. um, that, that now South Africans will have to flee from in order to find opportunities as our brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe have had to do, mm. to try and cross borders, get onto boats, um, cross, cross oceans, which is happening, mm. you know? Other, other people, other residents are fleeing from wars. Uh, you know, we will be fleeing from a government that implements mm. policies that completely kills any opportunity uh, of a better life uh, mm. in South Africa. Now, I don't want to have a situation, Pumla, I don't think you would either, where my children and their children um, would, would have to grow up in, in a state where everything is broken. Mm. Um, in, capital has, has, has flown out the door. Um, there is, and the ANC, e even now, I mean, even without an a a EFF coalition partner, seem to be so negligent with the economy. You look at what's happening with Russia and how they have put uh, at risk agreements like AGOA and trade agreements mm. that, are, that are sustaining hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, across the country. Can you imagine <laughs> if you have... Uh, an ANC EFF coalition that's going to um, drive out any kind of investment, ensure that there's no environment for jobs to be created, for for people, for for institutions that, that will give our people opportunity. It will be the end uh, of an opportunity state if there ever was one. You know, speaking about a developmental state, it will really be a pariah state that that our children mm. will not will, will have to flee from in boats and in rafts and in. Uh, across borders in order to find opportunities because there'll be nothing at home. Yusuf, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sitting down with us. I know we've taken so much of your time. Really enjoyed talking to you. Lastly, what's your message to people of the Eastern Cape? We deserve better. We deserve so much better than what we have uh, in our province. And the only way that we are going to have the opportunities that we need, that we have the services that we, that, that, that we actually need to live a life of meaning uh, is to, to vote a different government in. Our government have shown us in the Eastern Cape that they have absolutely no regard. It's all about who are you connected to, who are you willing to sleep with if you're going to get a, a job in the Eastern Cape, mm. and that should never be something that we just fold our arms and accept. A couple of weeks ago, we had a by-election in Port St. John's. The DA grew in that by-election from about 4% to 22%. Um, you know, from the 21 elections till now. So it's just in about a, a year and a half. And it showed to us that people of the Eastern Cape from all backgrounds, I mean, those are deep rural, uh, historically traditional ANC voters in the ANC heartland um, who have now decided, you know, we, we want something. We, it's time for change. We want something mm -hmm. different. We deserve something better than this. We're not going to accept it. Go out and register. Register to vote. Vote for change. Vote for the Moonshot Pact because we believe that we can save South Africa. And we can set our country on a, on, on, on a path of growth and prosperity rather than on a path of doom. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you.